Um, so yeah, thanks for attending. Um, I heard there were some questions around fundraising, so I'm happy to talk about uh, my experience. So um, I run a, a crypto investment firm called Scalar Capital. We invest in tokens and coins specifically, so that's kind of our area of specialty. Um, but I have been doing a number of angel investments in the space. And um, I also raised for my own management company, so I can talk about my own experience there. Um, and then um, previously I was at Coinbase as a product manager. So um, yeah, important things to know even before you start raising. Um, I think it's just critical to know that uh, how much you raise is not the metric for success. I know that's um, uh, shared really heavily in Silicon Valley where people are saying like they raise this amount of money and um, I know in the crypto space, the rounds are getting pretty out of control, but um, we've seen a number of projects that have raised a lot of money that have not been very successful. So really try to think through um, if you're trying to build something for the long run, uh, that's not the metric you should be shooting for. Make sure to um, be uh, making this um, where you're bringing in a lot of really good investors and you're also thinking through whether or not you even need to raise in the first place. So uh, important to know like what is your actual business model? So sometimes you're building something really awesome that's great for um, furthering the space and it's really good infrastructure. You might not actually have a really clear business model and, and that's okay. So uh, in the crypto space, there's actually a lot of opportunities for getting grants. Uh, so we have uh, the Xerox Ecosystem Accelerate, Acceleration Program. There's also the Ethereum Foundation Grant Program. And there's a ton of other grants that are given out in the space. And so I have a link in the resource section where it's just a comprehensive list of grant programs. Um, this is a really great way of, um, if you don't know your business model and you, it's not really clear, then you can actually buy a lot of time by just getting applying for this grant program, getting some money to continue building, um, actually ship a product, and then from there, maybe you can start raising if, if you're still interested. Um, and then in this space especially, I think um, people have been tacking on tokens that aren't necessary. And so really think through that if you do decide to raise, do you actually need to have a token in your system? Uh, it's a lot harder to issue a token that isn't um, isn't actually necessary for your system and then remove it versus adding on your token uh, later when you decide that. Uh, so I think uh, DYDX and Dharma are really great examples of this. There was a ton of people they were raising during this time where um, <coughs> there were a lot of projects adding on tokens and they actually decided to um, do a traditional equity round and then think through whether or not they're adding a token later on. Um, and then just also, uh, if you do decide to raise, uh, what's the amount that you actually need in order to implement what you're trying to build? So uh, you don't need to just raise an arbitrary, like, you know, $50 million, because that's what some of these like huge um, crypto projects are raising. You really think through like what you're actually trying to build, who you need to hire for, what legal bills you need to pay and all that kind of stuff. So getting into the actual um, pitch itself, um, you're definitely going to want to have a pitch deck. Um, it's really common for people to have like, you know, um, these like white papers and technical papers in the crypto space. But uh, as you talk to investors, they don't have that much time to be reviewing what you're working on. So it's really important that you actually have a consolidated pitch deck and, um, and, and make it really clear. So I think the best pitch deck template is actually Sequoia Capitals. So they actually um, have a breakdown of kind of what areas you should be talking about. And, and in this order, uh, I, you don't have to like follow this to the T, but I, I do think that this is really a, a good approach. So first, uh, starting off with the company and project purpose, um, make this really concise and clear what you're actually trying to build. There's been so many times where um, I'm talking with a number of other investors about our project, and at the end of the day, like we actually couldn't even figure out what this project is trying to build. Like it was just still really unclear. So start off the bat with just what's the purpose of what you're trying to build. Then going into the actual problem, um, I think a lot of projects actually miss this aspect of it. Um, they don't talk enough about like why this, um, why you actually need like a decentralized version of this or um, why you actually need um, a token in the system or something like that. So like, what's the actual problem in this model? Are you trying to, um, are, is it that people don't have incentives in the system for to work properly or um, are people struggling with uh, UI UX and you're trying to improve that? So really talk about the problem um, and then get into the solution, which is what you're working on. Um, why now is, is pretty important in the space because um, 
I, I've talked to a lot of projects and investors who've looked at the same project, and we often come to the conclusion that, oh, this is a really cool project, but it actually seems like too early for something like this. So um, it, like with investors, it's a lot about timing. Like it could be a really great idea, but it's the wrong timing. So it, it's really helpful if you provide that information to them. So why now? Like what, um, what technology has come along that really makes this something that's um, worth building right now? And, um, and, and so like, I think that's really cool. Um, market size is, is really critical as well. Um, in the crypto space, um, I've seen a number of projects that are super interesting and very, um, very like futuristic, but at the end of the day, the market size seems very, very small. So you want to make sure that uh, if you're talking to investors that you're talking about the um, market opportunity, um, the total addressable market. And for them, um, if you lay this out, and, and metrics are always extremely helpful here, if you lay this out, they're more likely to um, be interested in, in talking and potentially investing. Um, you want to go over the competition and advantages. Um, I think that this is, in crypto, is particularly hard, especially if you're an open, open source project. You want to make sure that you talk about the moat that you do have. So what's your edge as you're building this? Because it's all open source. So if, um, if you see that, uh, you know, someone just has code out there and, and someone could just uh, copy, fork it away or t fork away your token or just um, take the exact same code and just try to implement it better. Um, so you really have to like think through like what are your advantages and really lay this out for investors since they don't often have time to like think through like all the different edge cases. Uh, obviously product and roadmap. Uh, I think roadmap here is where I've seen a lot of crypto projects not do a good job on. I think that they're insanely overly ambitious with their roadmap. And remember that it's always better to uh, under promise and over deliver. And so when we see like these roadmaps in um, the white papers or pitch decks, oftentimes it's, it's off by like even like a couple of years. So I think that um, it's really important that you're being realistic with your roadmap because investors will see through it if you're being like way too ambitious and this is not even possible. Of course you want to be ambitious, but I, I just, I feel that crypto has been particularly unrealistic with the roadmap and timeline. Um, we talked about business model here. Um, and then, uh, yeah, you want to feature the team. Uh, so talk about why, uh, you know, the background of the team, uh, like where you've worked previously. This is like very similar to just traditional um, equity. Uh, you can also, if you feel like you, your team is particularly strong and is going to grab a lot of attention, you can move this team slide up closer to the top. I've seen a number of projects do that. Don't overemphasize it because it also at the same time, if you're like, overemphasizing how your team went to Stanford and everyone's um, everyone's like from Stanford and all that kind of stuff like over and over again, like it, it is like actually um, detracting away from what you're actually building. So um, make sure to not like go too crazy on that. Uh, and then um, the financials. So at the very end of your deck, you want to talk about uh, how much you're trying to raise. Uh, I've seen a lot of projects um, say what they're um, spending that money on. And so it'll be like this pie chart with a breakdown of, um, of like what they're spending on. So like legal bills, hiring, operations, marketing, all that kind of stuff. So whatever details you can provide here is really helpful for investors. And it depends on how you're raising, but um, you can also put in the valuation here. Um, some, some projects, when they raise a seed round, um, they will actually go out and say, this is how much we're trying to raise and at this valuation, and then they try to find the investors that will um, be interested in that valuation. Or there's the way of just saying, we're trying to raise this amount of money and we're trying to find a lead investor that will try to set the terms for us. And so they'll, they'll help determine the valuation and then um, subsequent investors coming into the round will then come in at that valuation. So it really depends on how you wanna set this up. Uh, I'll get into that a little bit more later. Uh, yeah, and then so after you've um, created your pitch deck, then you basically need to start sending it out. So, of course, warm intros are the best. Really tap into your network. Um, you'd be surprised that um, of the people that you know know other people that uh, would be useful for talking to. Um, I myself, I kept a, a list of the people that I knew and, and who I wanted to reach out to. So that was really helpful. Um, I think that Twitter is like the, one of the best resources possible for actually reaching out to investors. 
uh, there's, especially in crypto, there's such a strong community of people um, interacting there and being very accessible. Um, myself, uh, I actually got my, um, some of my like major investors through just reaching out on Twitter. So it's, um, it's really great, but make sure that it's, um, it's like a very compelling um, DM or, or tweet. Like it's not just like, hey, can we chat? Like you wanna make sure that you're actually um, making it really clear like why you wanna talk to them in particular. Uh, because you're participating in a hackathon, actually one of the best ways is to just follow up with the judges at this hackathon. So there's a number of really good investors uh, in this hackathon. So you can just talk to them directly. They've likely already seen your project. They've been judging it. So, um, this is a really great way of just instantly expanding your network. And um, there's a number of really great judges who aren't investors, but I'm sure they know a bunch of investors. So that if they're impressed by your project, they're likely to make those intros. And I've um, met actually with a number of projects from various ETH global hackathons, and I was really impressed with what they built. So I ended up helping them out. Um, so use them as resources. Um, something that I think I wish I had known when I started fundraising uh, was talk to angel investors first to get feedback and then improve your pitch. I, um, off the bat, um, pitched Sarah Tavel at Benchmark, um, like the day I left Coinbase, and I, had, I didn't even have the name of what I was building. I didn't have um, like any idea of like what it was even going to look like, like nothing. And she was super nice and helpful, but like, I wish I had saved that for later on when like things were um, actually figured out and I had feedback. So just um, talk to like people who are very open to giving feedback, knowing that this is, um, this is like very much in the early phases of what you're thinking through. Um, very important when you're actually building something out, I get diverse investors so you can build better products. Um, and this diversity includes like global diversity. So like if you're building a protocol or some tool that's going to be used by hopefully everyone in the world, you want to make sure you're getting uh, opinions from everyone out there. So, um, you know, if, if, if you particularly want to target the Asian market, like make sure you're getting Asian investors. Um, so like you can, um, there's a lot of like hashed is a big crypto fund in Korea and, um, and primitive ventures is really well connected in, in China. So make sure that you're getting different perspective. Uh, this is really helpful later down the line when you're asking for feedback from your investors. Um, people get really caught up in the space about brand names and, um, who they've raised from. Um, I actually, I have some, I have a number of brand name investors in, in, in my, um, in my list, but I actually found that some of the most helpful investors weren't necessarily the brand names. So make sure to just get people that are super long-term focused who can actually help you. Uh, you, the only time where brand name is, I think really helpful is actually with recruiting. Uh, so it, it is nice to have at least like maybe one brand name because um, when you're trying to convince people to leave a more stable company, you want to be able to point to, well, we're backed by, you know, these investors. So we're not like completely random project that you're going to maybe lose all your time um, working with us. So that can be pretty helpful with recruiting and be really careful about having too many investors. So this is what's called a party round. I, had, I wish I had actually known this when I first started fundraising. Um, we ended up uh, we ended up being oversubscribed when we raised, so we had uh, a lot of interest, and I felt really bad about cutting people out. So I just kind of had like everyone in the round, and I just ended up cutting down at the allocations. And this isn't ideal because it, because you end up cutting down allocations so that um, so that people actually aren't as incentivized to help you. So like if you like wanted to put in like 100K and you only got like, you know, 20K, you're, you're not as involved in the project potentially. Uh, some people just are involved regardless of the amount, but uh, you wanna make sure that you're aligning incentives. So um, if I were to redo things in terms of my own fundraise, I would have uh, made sure to be really careful about selecting who are actually the people that are gonna be most helpful to me and then make sure that they're getting the allocations that they need. Um, and then lastly, you're gonna be reaching out to a number of people. So make sure to actually keep track of it in a spreadsheet because even if they say no in this current round, you actually um, don't know if they're interested maybe later on. Like the reasons could be like, oh, I, I'm still learning about this space or maybe I, I wanna see more 
traction with what you're building first. So um, keep, keep this list and then also um, write some notes about how the meeting went and what were some concerns and then make sure to follow up in the future. So great ways to follow up here could be uh, reaching out to the investor and saying, hey, we've had, this, um, we've had this huge milestone, we'd love to get feedback on it or we're about to launch this milestone or we'd like feedback on it. Um, are you interested in, in getting monthly investor updates? I've seen a number of projects do that and I think it's been really, um, really successful. So that's kind of my uh, reaching out uh, aspect and then some resources. Uh, I, so I mentioned the grants programs. So Freddie Archibald put together this really awesome crypto grants list. One um, thing that's not on there that I think is really good to uh, include uh, as, as you reach out is uh, Coinbase Ventures. They're kind of like, in my view, this like hybrid program because they're really focused on uh, supporting the ecosystem and kind of furthering the space. And they're not managing like LP money, like investor money, and they're managing their own money. So they don't have to focus so much on like the returns right off the bat. So um, they're really great people uh, to reach out to. Um, the Sequoia uh, pitch deck template is linked here. Uh, I, I really think this is like super great template. Um, Alad Gill, uh, who's one of my investors and one of the smartest uh, people I know, is uh, he has this fundraising tips slides where he kind of talked a little bit more about uh, the rounds and like what timelines it looks like. For example, like, you know, like it could take uh, a couple weeks to several months for these rounds to close. So he gets a little bit more into the details on that. And I think Set Protocol uh, has a really great post on um, just their experience with fundraising and specifically for a crypto project. So I recommend taking a look at that. And then lastly, uh, you want to make sure that your, uh, your investor materials are actually uh, locked down and in control. So uh, basically, you don't want your pitch deck to be floating around to like everyone out there because people will send your pitch deck to like other people. Uh, it might end up in the hands of your competitors or just you, you want to have control over where it gets shared. So DocSend is my favorite resource for that. I'm sure there's other, um, there's other really great services for that, but DocSend makes it really easy to uh, lockdown controls, whitelist addresses. Um, uh, you can also uh, like watermark your documents. So I, I recommend using something like that. Uh, yeah, so I think that, yeah, that's about 20 minutes. So um, I'll leave some time for Q&A. So does anyone have any questions? Who is someone that we can talk to um, to, to uh, get to the, what was it, the Coinbase Ecosystem Fund? Do you have like a contact or? A oh, Coinbase Ventures. Um, so uh, Justin Mart is pretty involved there and he's on Twitter. So um, you might be able to reach out to him through there. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Linda, um, the transaction volume for the entire DAP ecosystem is currently pretty low. What indicators do investors look for when investing in DAPs? Um, yeah, that one's kind of hard. I, so I would say that they are looking for um, they're looking for the total addressable market. So uh, they're not necessarily looking specifically for just like the transaction volume right now because everyone knows it's just really low. So they're looking for like what what industry are you trying to disrupt so if you're talking specifically about like let's say you're doing this like um like a, a project like gods and chain where it's um kind of like hearthstone but now the cards are tradable well what's the market for something like hearthstone what is the market for like magic the gathering um if you're doing um if you're doing like collectibles like compare the collectibles to like baseball cards and um, and like other industries where people are collecting uh, cards. So I, I would say like people do know that it's just really low right now, um, but you want to talk about like what it can get to. Um, I would also definitely uh, emphasize like growth. So like even though it is really low, like you want to also point to like, well, actually every, every week or every month we actually have X percent of growth. And so it, even though you're really small, like it shows that there's going to be uh, given this growth, like you're actually getting a lot of um, traction. Uh, you can show um, if you have like revenue, you can show the growth in revenue, number of users. Um, you can also um, you can also like talk about partnerships. So how many partnerships do you have? What's um, what's you know like the 
like contracts that you're signing like what numbers are we talking about here so there's a lot of ways to like just emphasize like growth and opportunity cool any i mean any other questions i'm, I'm happy to cover like whatever can be helpful to you guys uh, first of all, great presentation, and um, you mentioned that uh, there are some cases when it is useful to create own coin, and uh, in some cases it is not. So, from um, your experience, when it is more uh, like uh, useful to do it, and when uh, better to not. Thanks. Well, generally, I would say like rule of thumb is if you can take that token and replace it with ether then it's probably not necessary just because if it acts the exact same way, all you're doing is really adding additional friction. So it has to be completely unique to making the system work properly. And I think like Augur is a really great example of this where you actually need rep in order to uh, align incentives for people to be voting on the outcome of these events and actually reporting correctly. And so um, you can't actually like replace this with ETH and have it work the exact same way. So I, I would just like do that test. Um, there are other projects that um, they decide to raise a token as a security token. And I, I do think that um, it's a little bit too early to be doing that right now. I, I love the idea and that like they're trying to be crypto native, but I think that there's a lot of um, investors that actually aren't, able to invest in security tokens like so a lot of the traditional vcs don't have their um, lp agreements set up with like their investor agreements set up to invest in in any like sort of token so um, i think you end up like complicating things a little bit and um, people maybe like maybe a little bit more confused or like what you're doing but like can't invest in the token or like are confused by the token so you just kind of like want to reduce the amount of complexity to get an investor onboarded. I do think like later on security tokens will be a lot more popular and, um, and used, but you don't want to be like the pioneering security tokens and do a pioneering crypto project. What runway do you suggest uh, teams aim at when raising like 12 to 18 months or better to aim for 24 months plus? Yeah, I think that's, that one's hard. I think it really depends on what you're, trying to do but generally i i do think 18 months has been really a, a good um time frame and i think that um especially since we're in a bear market if you can uh make sure to um kind of have like some some buffer in case things come up uh so yeah ideally like i'm a little bit more on the conservative side but i would say like even two years yeah 24 months would be like really great Uh, one more question. A question. Uh, you go first. Yeah, sorry. Uh, go, go. Sure. So, yeah, earlier you were discussing, um, there was another fellow asking a question about um, what are the strategies given that the transaction volume is relatively low across the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So, another question relating to that, given that they are not really kind of proven business model, proven monetization um, methods for crypto products, specifically for like purely crypto products like compound finance or like zero X even stuff that are like awesome and everything, mm -hmm. but it's still not proven to be profitable or um, like th that it has legs, so to speak. So how do you feel about investing or like how do investors feel about investing in startups that is focused mainly on getting the traction and growth potentially and figuring out monetization. Um, yeah, uh, so investors are super open to that, especially if you have like the long-term focus investors. So like I, I'm an investor in DYDX and um, back then like the, when I invested, like they weren't really sure about the business model and like how it was gonna play out. So um, yeah, investors are super open to that. You just have to, um, really showcase like the potential. So like in that case, like, oh, if you're doing decentralized derivatives, like what is like the derivatives market or like in case of like Dharma, what's like the actual debt market. Um, but you yourself might not necessarily know like what's the demand for decentralized derivatives or decentralized debt. 
So um, yeah, I've seen tons of investors invest um, in the seed round without knowing the business model. If you get to series A, that's a completely different story and, and you'll definitely have to know your business model. But early on, like um, really good investors, like who care, like they won't be super critical about that. Any and advice for companies that raise a seed round partially in crypto in regards to treasury management? Oh yeah, I have like strong thoughts on this one. So. I think it's really important that uh, you actually um, take that crypto and, and sell it to something more stable. Like if you really want to hold on to crypto, maybe you can have like some and die. But generally, like it, that money is used for you to actually build out your product and build out your team and make sure that you have the runway that you needed. So you should not be exposing yourself to the volatility of crypto that's left for um, crypto investors, right? So uh, for me, I think, um, if I were to be running a crypto project I, and I accepted crypto, I would immediately convert it to fiat. I, it, it's really not ideal to be betting. And we've seen um, the case where projects right now actually can't even build what they were supposed to build because they uh, have lost like almost all of their runway. Um, uh, uh, speaking about uh, market size, if uh, the market is not like, uh, not looks uh, very big, but uh, it is clear and uh, there is still uh, like value for customers and money there, but uh, it is not looking very big. So how investors look on such projects? Uh, that one's a little bit unclear to me. Um, I probably, it, it depends on what you're doing, but you might want to like pick investors that are a little bit more focused on that space in particular. So if it's not like a really big investable opportunity, or, like a really big market for them, maybe they've invested in something that benefits from that market being created. So like, um, so then like they're more incentivized to help support this. So I would kind of go after people that invested in like, um, in like a kind of like a really similar business model or really similar projects to this. If that, does that make sense? Yeah, got it. Cool. <laughs> could, you, could you tell us what teams are doing <clears throat> in terms of like strategy and budget for legal and compliance? Yeah, uh, so in terms of legal, uh, Perkins has been pretty popular. Um, I know that a lot of crypto projects have worked with them. It, it is quite expensive though. I've seen a ton of different quotes from like a few hundred thousand dollars to like a million. And so that is like pretty, depends on of course what you're doing. So like if you're doing like anything related to like finance that's like heavily regulated, you, you will definitely need to um, pay on the higher end of that. But um, if you're doing something like collectibles, like you probably won't have to pay as much. Um, so yeah, Perkins is popular. I know Goodwin Proctor is also in this space. Um, and so, yeah, I, I generally do hear Perkins the most though. And then in terms of compliance, um, I haven't seen people hire like a chief compliance officer off the bat. Like it's, it's pretty like normal for a project so early on in the stage to like not have a dedicated compliance per person. So you can kind of rely off your uh, lawyers for that. But as you do um, scale up, maybe like you you um, find that your legal bills are so high, like such a huge percentage of your operating costs, then people will start bringing in a, a in-house counsel. So they'll just have someone that's on the team that has that legal background. Yeah, that's what I was wondering is like, it seems like over time, um, it might be wiser to start out with a general counsel um, and, and, and just have them deal with like each individual piece of compliance within the different um, specializations. Um, I'm just wondering, yeah, like what the time frame for that bringing that person in house you think would be? It, it really varies. I've seen teams bring that in when they're like 10 people, and I've seen others bring it in when they're like 30. Um, okay. So it, it really varies. But um, yeah, if your legal bills are just crazy, then I think it's earlier the better. Okay. Yeah, I worked on a security token last year, and they ended up spending a million dollars to to basically let Pillsbury <laughs> bring them up, bring themselves up to speed with with securities law and token. Yep. Yeah. Do you have any insights into what types of ideas are getting traction with investors right now? And if so, are there any resources for finding this out? 
Um, a lot of that data is like, I think private because they're still private rounds, but from what I'm seeing right now, it's a lot of the picks and shovels of the space. So like um, exchanges and custodians and wallets and staking services, like those are the types of things that I'm seeing getting funded just because we are in a bear market and like the things that still do well are like these like picks and shovels. So um, that's kind of what I'm seeing getting funded. Have the volumes of start startups pitching you uh, gone down compared to last year or how, how is that looking? Yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. Like last year was insane. Like I, I would probably get, I don't know, like a hundred pitches a week. Um, and like vast majority of them are just really terrible. Like it's like the worst projects you'll, you have ever seen or heard of. Um, but now um, it's, it's calmed down a lot, but the quality of projects is a lot higher. So like projects raising during this bear market, like oftentimes are the ones that like actually care about what they're building and like not trying to just like get rich quick. So um, in terms of like sheer, like high quality projects, it's, it's probably about the same or, or even higher. In these picks and shovel ideas, uh, how many of these companies are at uh, seed, seed round and how much do you expect a company in seed to, to start raising if they say a wallet? Uh, so, they're almost all seed rounds right now from what I'm seeing just because we are so early on and um, and if you're like just building your product and uh, you go out to raise like you you're going to be doing a seed so um, almost all of them are seed and then uh, in terms of how much they're raising I mean it, it really ranges but I've seen like one to three million dollars is like pretty common for the seed rounds um, Two million is like quite common as well. Uh, what what about like um, I, a two person team? Is is that generally the size of a company raising seed in the crypto space, or what would you say is like the early starting seed size for a team? Uh, yeah, it it really yeah that totally varies, but yeah, two is okay. is pretty common. I've seen. Um, I've seen some of them like three or four because they'll say like, oh, we've also like have some engineers that are working on this. But yeah, it, it, two, two is very common. Cool. Hello. Um, where would you recommend to incorporate? Uh, because in Wyoming, uh, they're quite pushing some positive uh, bills for crypto. Mm -hmm. um, but I know that most investors uh, only invest in Delaware companies. So I don't know exactly where to incorporate. Uh, yeah, I have a little bit less insight into that. Um, I, at Wyoming, I've been following a bit of what they're doing. Uh, I think if it's it's really friendly to crypto companies, it's it's certainly worth considering. Delaware is, is very common. I've also seen uh, a number of projects where they're incorporated internationally. So Cayman Islands has been a popular one as well. I don't feel like I come across that many investors in the crypto space that say that they only would like invest in a Delaware corporation. So I, yeah, I don't think that's as big as a deal as, as it is in maybe like traditional equity, but I, it, I'm not as certain about that piece though. Okay, so, so I could just incorporate in uh, Wyoming and get enough investors. I would think so if, especially if, like, like I can only speak for myself and like people I've talked to, but um, like if you were to go and say like, oh, we incorporate specifically in Wyoming because of this, 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 all this friendly regulations is actually beneficial to us. Like I can't imagine an investor being like, oh no, no way I'm investing in you because you were thoughtful about where to incorporate and where regulation is friendly. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Um, I think that's it, right? Is that? Um, it looks like there was one other question that was posted on Discord. Uh, any experience with uh, the YC safe denominated in crypto and anything to watch out for? Um, 
No, I, I haven't experienced that, unfortunately. I'm sorry. I, um, I haven't heard any issues with that, though. Like, no one's brought that up to me. But yeah, I'm sorry. I wish I had more of a concrete answer to that. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, <clears throat> Linda, thank you so, so much for this. This was really, really awesome. Uh, we'll be sure to share the recording in the next couple of days or so. And uh, yeah, thank you to everyone for joining in. And uh, we're excited to see what you submit for the hackathon. Yeah, sounds good. And then if you guys just feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. Um, I'm at LJXIE and I'm happy to give feedback on stuff. Awesome. Thank you so much, Linda. Okay, thanks. Thank Bye. You.